back when John Sawat was asked to teach in Massachusetts. The person organizing the retreat was talking about how this was going to be a good chance for people to get to know the forest tradition. But he asked Jean Sawat not to teach contemplation of the body. I was there at the discussion. In fact, I was the translator. It was a couple of days before the retreat. The look that Jean Sawat gave to the organizer when he said that made me realize that we were going to get some talks on contemplation of the body. And sure enough, we did. Third night. He introduced the topic to talking about a woman who had studied with a John Fun, who was meditating, focusing on Bhutto, repeating the word Bhutto, and focusing on her breath. And all of a sudden she had a vision of a corpse lying right in front of her. She didn't want to be so near the corpse, so she moved back. The corpse moved closer to her. She moved back again. The corpse moved in closer to her again. And finally, it became her body in the vision. And so John Sweat talked about how John Fun had told her to think about her body in the sense that someday it's going to be a corpse. And do you want to hang around in this corpse? No. But as Zhang Furang noted when he was teaching in Bangkok, a lot of people hang around their bodies because they don't know where to go. They identify so strongly with their bodies. So even if you don't have issues of lust or pride around your body, still there's a very strong attachment. You can't imagine being without the body. And it's good to be prepared, because the body's going to do a lot of things you won't expect unless you think, th think it through. If you don't want to think about the fact that you're going to die, and this body you're sitting in right now is going to turn into a corpse. It's going to be hard when the time when it actually happens. So it's good to think ahead of time. In the forest tradition, the two contemplations in the Siddhipatthana Sutta, having to do with the unattractiveness of the body on the one hand, going through the body's thirty-two parts. It's thirty-one parts in the canon. The commentary adds the brain. Or the contemplation of the different stages of decomposition. They usually put them together. When John Fung was teaching meditation, sometimes he'd have people get spontaneous visions of themselves sitting in front of themselves. I'd say, so I'd <coughs> say, imagine the body one year from now, two years from now, three, four, five, ten, twenty. And then depending on how old they were, how many times it took, how many multiples of five before you get to when you die. And then think about what's going to happen to it after you die, first day, second day, third day. We don't see much of that here in the States. When somebody dies, they get whisked off. In Thailand, it's not so quick. People actually do see more stages of decomposition. And you look at it and you say, hmm, I wouldn't want to hang around that. And then John Fung would have them cremate it until it's nothing but dust, and then reassemble it from the dust back to the corpse, from the corpse back to the old person, from the old person back down to where you are right now. To remind yourself, okay, this is all connected. That's meant to make you want to look someplace else for your happiness. And to give you a sense of sangweka. Because if you, at the moment of death, if you latch on to another body, it's going to be the same sort of thing all over again. Then you can develop a sense of peace in the meditation and get so that you can focus on something formless like space or the awareness itself. You realize that you have an alternative spot to go. Some people might say, well, your imagination of space and your imagination of consciousness depend on the body. 
But the actual experience of space, the experience of consciousness, doesn't necessarily have to depend on a body. There are formless beings. This, the Buddha said, is one of those things that he couldn't prove to you ahead of time, but he said it's a good thing to take as a working hypothesis. It helps you realize that you have more choices than just having to come back to another body and do these things all over again. So even if you don't like your body, at the very least realize that it's not disliking it because you don't want to have anything to do with it. It's disappointed you one way or another, but you're still very attached. So think of it in terms of the different parts. And John Munn would recommend that you go down the list that we chatted just now. Hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, skin. And you get one that really hits you. Sometimes a spontaneous vision will arise, sometimes not, but you get a strong sense of some way going with the fact that, gosh, there's that in my body as well. Focus on that one. You don't have to do the whole body, just that one part. Think about the fact that you're living with this weird thing that's inside you, or around you, on, on the, say, the skin. And think of all the issues that are created around that particular part, or the illnesses in that part. If it's one of the exterior parts of the body, people get really attached to how it looks. But then if you were to take it off and just have it as a separate piece, you wouldn't want to look at it at all. And this is where the contemplation turns into the focus on the mind. Why does the mind play these tricks on itself? One thing that looks really attractive in one context becomes unattractive in another context. What's going on? The mind wants this to be attractive. For what purpose? Keep digging into those questions. And you find that you learn a lot of interesting lessons about the mind. Because the issue, of course, is not the body. The issue is the mind. The body can just do its thing, and it's not upset. The body's not upset when it dies. It's the mind that's upset. It's going to go looking for another one, if you're not careful, if you're not trained. Or it's just going to hang around this one as it decomposes, which is also an unpleasant place to be. John Fung had a student one time who was meditating with him in Bangkok. And the place where he was meditating was a two-story building, and it overlooked a field. He was up in the second story, and overlooking this field of what they call envelopes. These are concrete structures, brick and concrete structures were just big enough to put a coffin in. And there are lines and lines and lines of them. Because in Thailand, when a person dies, you don't have the funeral right away sometimes. Sometimes you have to wait until the family can afford it. Sometimes you have to wait until a son or a daughter who's studying abroad comes back home. The family can get together and they can do a proper job. So in the meantime, you need a place to put the coffins. So they had these envelopes lined up behind Wabakut. As a woman was meditating, she had this vision of people performing a ceremony where they're putting a coffin in one of the envelopes. And there was a man wearing a suit standing right at the entrance to the envelope. And as the ceremony was over and people were going their separate ways, he stayed right there, looked left, looked right, and went soup into the envelope. It startled her. So she got from, up from meditation, glanced out the window. Sure enough, people were going their separate ways from having performed that ceremony. So without saying anything to John Fung, she went down and had asked him, the person who died, did he look like this? And she described the man in the suit. They said, yep, that's the man. So she went back up and asked John Fung what she should do now. So he told her to get back in meditation and see if she can get that vision again, which she did. He said, okay, now look in the envelope. And there she saw him squatting down right next to his body, looking lost not knowing where to go. That's when Jean Fung said, okay, now dedicate the merit of your meditation to him. And the woman said it was like a light going out of her chest. 
out of her heart. And the man was like a deer in the headlights, looked over in her direction, had this brief look of recognition on his face, and then disappeared. As John Fung told me at another time, he would walk around Wabakut sometimes in the evening to exercise his legs. He came back one night and said, you know, the number of people who die and hang around their bodies is really large. You get the feeling he was probably walking around sending them off. So you don't want to hang around. This is the best way not to hang around is to think about what's going to happen to the body so you're not surprised by what it does. And remind yourself there's something better than this. We don't have to keep coming back for these bodies. As, as the Buddha said, if you were to take all the bones of one person for an aeon, and if the bones didn't decompose and there's someone to look after the pile, it would be huger than a mountain. We've been through so many bodies. You know, one of the reasons we're afraid to die is afraid we're going to leave this body. And of course, that fear primes us to latch onto whatever body comes into our range of awareness at that point. So learn to get some detachment from the body. See your attachment to the body as something strange. And that can save you a lot of grief. Speaking of those envelopes, they don't have them anymore. To put up a, a warehouse for store, storing the coffins. And the reason is related to a story that I always like to tell. As one of the monks I knew at the monastery needed a place to do walking meditation, he realized that the aisles between the envelopes were perfect walking meditation paths. So he'd go out at night and walk between the envelopes. And at first he was kind of freaked out, thinking about all the dead bodies around and the possibility that there might be spirits of the dead people still hanging around as well. But after time, doing this night after night after night, he got more and more used to it until it became very ordinary. And then there was one night as he was doing walking meditation, he said to himself, oh, I'm getting pretty good here. I'm not afraid of being around the bodies. All of a sudden, his hand reached out from one of the envelopes, grabbed him by the, leg, by the ankle. Well, it turned out it was a druggie. He was smoking a pot or something in an empty envelope. He was going to ask him for a match. <laughs> of course, the monk practically had a heart attack. But then it got so there were so many druggies hanging around in the empty, um, empty envelopes that they finally had to destroy them all and put up a warehouse with a lock on the door. So if you can learn how to think about the parts in your body, I mean, you're living with them day in, day out, and think about them without getting worked up about them. Just realize, okay, this is all there is to a body, just these things, and you were so attached to it, so attached to its needs. And people will do all kinds of things to protect their bodies, protect their survival of the body. And then it's going to die in them anyhow at some point, and they're going to get attached to a corpse. When you can see this is all very strange and undesirable, that's when you can open up the mind to the idea, well, maybe there's something better. <laughs>